The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass, a new production from Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass, and this is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, we will look at how one area of farming is going through some big changes. It's all about the pollinator. That's a hot topic in the agricultural world because of the decline in the world's bee population and what that could mean for farming, fresh produce, and a food supply. Farming standards are being changing, and there's preservation habits to hats that are changing, and there's bee farms that are changing across the U.S. But locally, there are farmers and town dwellers working together to help save bees right now. Here's a report from Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser. When I first started farming, my dad uh, gave me a little piece of advice. He says, why don't you take a few notes each year on what happened during the growing season and what was the weather like, how were the crops, what did you grow, and he, he says you'd be amazed at what you'll probably learn. Carmen Fernholz took his father's advice to heart and over the course of his lifetime as a farmer innovated the way the Fernholz farm ran, simply by remembering the ideas he had while in the field. Over the years that has been very beneficial to me because it's very important that I write it down. If not right there, at least when I get home back into the house, write it down, because if you don't write it down, it's gone. Gone forever, you might say. And so over the years, I've looked at those notes and looked at uh, what I was thinking at the time. And one of the major changes that uh, I used years ago even though I didn't have any forage eating livestock on my farm, was to introduce alfalfa into my rotation. And the reason I introduced it into the rotation because it, I found the previous summer that it was really helping me in weed management. And so I figured out how I could use alfalfa in my farming system as a, as a cash generating crop so that I wasn't going to, you know, lose out on the, on the potential income. This was his first adventure into the world of pollinator preservation. Pollinator habitats, I guess, came into my life years ago when I was looking at diversity in a cropping system. Over the years, as a certified organic producer, I've always been sensitive to a diversity on the landscape. How can we have more cropping system rather than less cropping system? How can we move away more from just, say, a corn and soybean rotation to a corn and soybean small grain a forage rotation? It was this sensitivity that led Fernholz to the NRCS, National Resource Conservation Services, Conservation Stewardship Program. It's a program that pays farmers a certain amount of money each year for five years to maintain various practices on their farms. Because I'm a certified organic farmer, a lot of the practices in this conservation stewardship program are already being done on my farm. But in order to qualify, I needed to find some more unique practices. Well, one of those practices was to plant what they call pollinator strips. And so uh, what they're asking is, in relation to the acreage on my farm, I needed to plant a certain number of acres into these pollinator plants. Fernholz has been in multiple different government programs, including fertility studies and erosion defenses. He calculated that for this next endeavor, he need approximately three acres to plant pollinator plants that meet the NRCS standards. We look at a diversified landscape. 
And if we're thinking in terms of a diversified landscape, we're, th we're thinking in terms of a diversified crops. And so moving more in the direction of thinking in terms of pollinators was just more or less moving in terms of thinking, so how does my diversified cropping really fit into the whole pollinator concept? I had these buffer strips that were about 30 feet wide and uh, over the years there had been uh, some grasses and uh, forages growing in there. What I was able to do is uh, do some serious tillage on there to root up those grasses and alfalfas and, and things and provide uh, a seed bed for the uh, pollinator crops. I was able to put together a package of pollinator plants to plant. It includes, I think, five native grasses like blue stem and buffalo grass and side oats, grandma, and then some, I think there's 20 species of flowering plants. Flowering plants that some of which blossom early in the season, some mid-season, and some late season to provide food for the pollinator uh, insects throughout the growing season. Even though Fernhole's pollinator buffer strips are only in their beginning stages, he walks the land and can see results. And if you see the prairie in the background here, which is a restored prairie, uh, in the summertime I can walk out there and see a lot of uh, different uh, insects flying around, bu uh, buzzing around. So there is an indication that the pollinators are there. And, that, and that's, a, that's a visible indication for me. I'm assuming that when my pollinator strips get uh, uh, to really full blossoming, like in three years, I'm going to see the same thing. So if I've got clovers or alfalfas in the cropping system, that's going to help. If I've got the pollinator strips, if I've got the buffer strips, they're all going to help. And I've got more than just a corn or soybean uh, menu for the pollinators. It's forced me over the years to be more creative in my cropping system, but then looking at how that cropping system can be a revenue generator is what drives me to be creative. Whether it's the cropping system, the insect world, or other wildlife, Fernholz thinks that in order for a farmer to really make the move to do anything like a pollinator strip or the buffer strips, they have to really examine their own understanding of their responsibilities as direct stewards of the land. And this is a long story, but the fact is when we understand what it is that we have to do to take care of the landscape, we begin to realize that it is not only the crops that we grow on the land, but it is the environment that we provide for the other insects that are part of the whole ecosystem. And in the end, it becomes a, a personal decision for each farmer, I think, to make and to realize that if we are to pass on to the next generations what we have been stewards of during our lifetime, that we have to be able to pass it on in as good or better condition than when we received it. And to really appreciate that responsibility takes time and understanding and effort. With us now to talk about how these efforts are affecting our region are a couple of guests. Dave Fredrickson is the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and also with us is Robin Trott. Robin is an Extension Educator in Douglas County with the Extension Office there in Alexandria. So Dave, Robin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Les. Good to be here. Good to be back home again. Yes, yes, because really we're very nice. close to where you farmed yeah, for so many for years. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, this is, this is a huge topic, and I know in some of our earlier discussions, Dave, you've said that even though a lot of people have heard about this in the last year or so particularly, I think it was about 2007, 2008, when it really started to, to, you know, to, to be aware That's for a lot correct. of people. Uh, colony collapse uh, became really a... Uh, a buzzword. A buzzword. That's okay, right. Good, good. <laughs> That's right. We, we've got that out yeah, of the way now. I so like yeah. it. All right. Buzzword is out. Very <laughs> yeah. well done. Yeah. Well done. Uh, so the rest, uh, uh, from here on out, we're dead serious, right? Uh, uh, what, uh, with you? I don't know, but keep going. <laughs> right. Uh, no, uh, colony collapse was a huge issue, is a huge issue. Uh, it impacts uh, so many people. Uh, we are uh, number seven in uh, honey production in the United States. It's an $18 billion industry. 
uh, in the U.S. Uh, we uh, produce about seven and a half million pounds of honey every year. North Dakota is number one. And so North Dakota, uh, North Dakota does about 33 and a half million pounds on an annual basis. South Dakota, a little less than that. Uh, so we have uh, Minnesota, uh, Montana, North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, the top six uh, honey producers. So it's all in the Midwest. So is this a big issue for uh, the Midwest states? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a huge issue. And I know while there a lot of attention gets paid to, to farmers in this, there's also homeowners that, of course, are enormously affected because they may be doing things that they're not aware have a dr dramatic impact on pollinators. And I know you've seen that in your work. Oh, absolutely. And, and we do talk about the honeybees a lot, and colony collapse disorder is certainly something we're very concerned about. But Minnesota has over 400 native pollinators, and a lot of these bees are solitary bees. They're bees that don't live in the hives like honeybees, like bumblebees. Um, they live solitary lives, often um, in holes in the dirt and such, and we depend on these pollinators as well. And so to educate the homeowners about the pollinators, good pollinator practices, um, pollinator-friendly yards, and recognizing um, good pollinators, uh, because whenever, any, whenever a homeowner says bee, what they're thinking of are yellow jackets, you know, those hornets that hang around State Fair and sting everybody, they're wasps. Um, they call them all bees, mm -hmm. and they think they're all going to sting. And so it's a real good... Um, what I try to do is educate them about the native pollinators because we do have the beekeepers that are taking care of the honeybees in our state. We don't have anybody looking after and um, being stored necessarily through their work of the native pollinators. And so I try to educate our homeowners about the native pollinators that are out there, take the fear of the sting out of them because there isn't that fear. There shouldn't be with the native pollinators and try to help them establish pollinator-friendly gardens in their yard. And of course, and for a homeowner, there are also some things they can look for in labels, correct? Or look at labeling or those kinds of things to sort of understand what they should do? Um, Pollinator friendly is, uh, is the term that the legislature deemed could be allowed okay. uh, at this point. And of course, there's always some tension, uh, particularly if you go to a big box store, you want to ask someone, does this product uh, uh, impact bees? And uh, they don't want, you know, that. Every, everyone has a, uh, an ox to gore in this issue. It's a retail issue. So uh, pollinator friendly, they can put on, on their packages today. And of course, when we took it labels, it's maybe pollinator friendly, but it's also following the directions to some extent, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And that's what we need to look at. Um, and, and that's where the extension office, if you have a local extension office, uh, go there if you, if you aren't sure about the label, or you can call. We have some telephone numbers you can call if you don't have um, a local extension office, help them decipher the label because the label will say exactly how to apply it, when to apply it, where to apply it, and then what exactly it does. So if it's a pesticide that kills insects, it will tell you exactly the insects it kills. Um, bees might be one of them. So you just need to be aware of um, all of those directions on how to use that pesticide you're using in your home garden. You can use them very responsibly, you just need to know how. Yeah. Backing up just a, a, sure. a briefly to your comment about native bees, uh, of that $18 million, $18 billion, about 15 of that, uh, you can, uh, uh, the responsibility really goes to the managed hives. About $3 billion of that are the native bees and, and their work in pollination. So, I mean, corn and soybeans, you know, the wind pollinates them, but, you know, the bees sit down and move the pollen. But um, alfalfa, they require those native bees to be out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's another fascinating part of this is people understanding the, the, the impact across all of agriculture. Because we often focus on honey yeah. or we often focus on the people who are in the business and, you know, for many years earned their living taking hives across states to apple orchards. But it's really much broader than that. Absolutely. Yes. It, yeah. it totally is. Yeah. Um, what about as you look at, uh, you talked about the, the spontaneous hive collapse. I mean, there are a number of things that, that I, I know, like for beekeepers too, there were things like, you know, the mites that they had to deal with that were a ferocious issue, and that got some attention for quite a long time. But what do we think are the next things that are going to happen uh, in, in terms of, you know, pollinators? Obviously, a public education campaign is a big part of it, right? It is, and bee health is really important, and there are a variety of things that impact bee health. One is, and you, you uh, pointed it out in your comments, varroa mite is the one that we've focused on uh, for in, 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 uh, in conjunction with beekeepers. 
Um, there are all kinds of uh, diseases that impact uh, beehives. There are pesticides that will impact them. I don't think if they're managed correctly, uh, you'll have a problem, but all by themselves, yes, they, they could cause problems. And so we're aware of that. I think it's uh, multiple effects that are impacting uh, colonies, and we follow the science as best we can in, in Minnesota and particularly at the Department of Agriculture. Well, right. and the thing with the beekeeping is it's, it's become the hot new hobby. Um, you can go to Fleet Farm, that's what's close to us, and buy all the beekeeping supplies you need. There are beekeeping classes out there. Municipalities are, are passing um, laws to allow beekeeping in their cities, in their towns. And so we're, it's nice because it's taking the fear of that stinging bee away from people. But we need to follow this trend and this enthusiasm about home beekeeping with good education as well. And there are all sorts of resources out there if you want to get into honey production, if you want to get into beekeeping. Sure, you can go on the internet and see any kind of video you want. But we have the Bee Lab at the University of Minnesota that offers classes in beekeeping. You have the Beekeepers Association in Minnesota that can help. And the thing that I always recommend if people really want to get into beekeeping is find a beekeeper. Because a lot of these beekeepers have been doing it for 40 years. We have a couple up in Douglas County that have been doing it since they were knee high to a grasshopper. They're the ones you want to get to show you how it's done, because I know I learn better when I'm shown how to do it than reading how to do it. And um, to have a mentor would help you be successful, because there is a lot of loss in beekeeping. There's a, there's a steep learning curve, and to know to do it well and to be able to manage your bees, because a, a bee to a beekeeper is, is livestock. It's like cattle to a cattle farmer. They have to manage these livestock responsibly and breed them and take care of the queen. And it's a lot of learning to do in a very short time to make sure that hive survives the winter in Minnesota. So. I think the learning is taking place. I, uh, I am aware of the fact that our Commissioner of Transportation, Charlie Zelli, is participating uh, at the national level on a panel to encourage uh, his colleagues across the United States to um, uh, look at uh, corridors um, where they will plant wildflowers along highways. We have those wildflower roots here in Minnesota. Uh, he wants to see that expanded. We're having a, a pollinator summit on the 12th of February this year. Commissioner Zali will be there to talk about their plans. Uh, I'm just really pleased that this is uh, bubbled to the surface uh, today and people are engaging. Uh, that's the way I think we want it to be. I don't necessarily think that regulation will come in and make the big change. I think I'm always a believer in education. That's why I love extension. That's their first responsibility is to educate and uh, you guys do a great job of it and I'm so glad that you're out there doing it. Yeah. Thank you. One of the things that, that came up in a recent conversation about pollinators is that there's also sort of an intersection that's interesting between people who are working on things that are friendly for pollinators and things that are friendly for water quality or other kinds of wildlife and there are some of those things that I think we're seeing with some, some wildlife groups for example where they may be planting plots of land or you know wildflowers and other things so Talk a bit about you know, some of the other implications when people do bee-friendly uh, you know, spots like well, that. Forage is in decline. I don't think there's an argument uh, mm -hmm. about that. Uh, we understand that. Bee population in decline. And so we need to stabilize and then we need to grow that. And I think everyone around the table understands that. The question is how best to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, farmers have to plant crops. Uh, there's no question about that. If you get rid of one pesticide, in this case the neonic, uh, neonicotinoids, uh, there's no doubt going to be another one. So uh, management, proper management, proper training, uh, new tools uh, for farmers to use, uh, hoods, uh, a variety of tools that will keep uh, the product on the ground. Uh, they have to use it. They have to use something, and so we all we have to uh, we have to be cognizant of that and, and work with those folks that that utilize product. Well, and you were saying less about the, um, the 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 wildflower and the buffer strips and these things that people are doing. And what's wonderful is a lot of that are the native plants, the native flowers. And if you think about native flowers and native bees, they evolve together. And, and we need all of the different sized bees, all the different kind of bees, because the flower structure is different and where the pollen is located in the flower is different. And so each of those bees has a very specific niche for getting their, uh, their food and a very specific flower they like. So if you put the wildflowers out there, you're providing a wide variety, hopefully that blooms season long, 
um, of different sizes, different shape flowers to accommodate all the different bees we have. Um, a lot of these native plants have very deep root systems. So now you've got something building the soil and making your soil health um, good or, or increasing your soil health. And um, you have got this nice habitat that you've created that's out there. So your soil is clean. You've got filters, a natural filter for your groundwater because you have encouraged this great plot with all these natives in there with their uh, root structure. And, and now you've got food and, and a place for these native bees to live. So it's kind of by doing one conservation measure, you can fulfill three different or four different things with this one thing and really build the health of your environment there, of your ecosystem. Sure. You mentioned early yeah. on yeah. about the intersection between water quality, water mm -hmm. management, uh, mm -hmm. uh, pollinators, habitat, and you, you have articulated how they come together. And that is exactly right. And as you see what, uh, what's going on around, not only here in Minnesota, but around the country, we have a special responsibility. We're a headwater state. Uh, we're unique. We have 10,000 plus lakes. We care about those lakes. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think you're going to see uh, uh, the legislature move forward with some things. It's certainly a priority on Governor Dayton's agenda as we move into this next legislative session, water particularly. So we're having a water summit. We're also having a pollinator summit. So there is definitely an interconnect there. Well, and some of the terms that we're hearing now, you know, we're not terms that we heard at all a few years ago. I mean, the term neonicotinoid was not something that we probably had any idea was being discussed. I couldn't even say the word. <laughs> exactly. Many people couldn't. But now we're hearing about and understanding what that is and, and the fact that that's an important thing for people to understand. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, if it's not neonicotinoids, it's going to be a midacloprid, uh, which is a uh, part of that family or some other uh, chemical. And so, absolutely, we're we're um, uh, we're surely engaged in the business of trying to educate public about the uses of product. And it strikes me too that even though a lot of the attention is paid to agriculture on this, uh, you know, farmers and homeowners also play a role because. Some people who may be doing these pollinator-friendly plots, mm -hmm. some of them could be, in fact, extremely small. They may be backyard plots, they may be gardens, they may be things who, you know, people who plant, you know, wildflowers in a can or whatever the product may be mm -hmm. to get that started. I'm sure we're seeing some of that. Absolutely. And so, um, so the rule of thumb in horticulture and gardening is never plant one and never plant an even number. So a lot of people have three of everything. And pollinators, when they go and collect pollen from a, a flower, they want to collect pollen from all the same flower. So all the daisies there, they'll go and visit all the daisies, or they'll go and visit all of the coreopsis if you're a gardener. Well, if you only have three of them, you're not providing a good food source. Now, this afternoon, they might go to a different flower, but for right now, they're collecting from that one flower. So if you just have a small spot as a gardener, look for those plants and plant 10 of them. Okay, that's even, but we can break the rule for the pollinators. Plant 10 of them there. That gives them an adequate source of pollen from that particular plant. And then think about these perennials. Those are the ones that come back year after year. And think about how, well, this perennial blooms in June, but it stops blooming because they usually have a short bloom time. It stops blooming in July. What's going to take its place? Yeah. And then that stops blooming in August. So what's going to take its place? And what's going to keep them fed from May to September? You know, Because once the nights get cooler and the days get shorter, they begin to... Um, I don't know if hibernate is the right word, but they go to bed for the winter. And so we need to... You get lazy. There you go. We need, or crabby like, <laughs> like the... Like people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this is true. Yeah. Um, so you want to have that consistent um, quantity yeah. of, sure. of forage for these pollinators throughout the season. And you can do it in a small spot. You just have to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the three of everything isn't probably a good choice. Yeah. Well, it strikes me, too, that, that as... For both of you and your work, I mean, you're seeing people coming up with questions, right? So, uh, you know, in the last few minutes of the show here, let's talk a little bit about how people can get more information because there's our discussion here, but the Department of Agriculture, the Extension Service, what are some of the resources where people want to learn more about this? Well, certainly uh, uh, Extension is the place to go. Uh, we come in behind Extension at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Go to our website. Uh, the legislature provided us with uh, resources to uh, publish a couple of pieces in 2014 on uh, best management practices for backyards, best management practices for road size, best management practices for farm uh, fields, uh, strips along uh, the, uh, the crop area. And so uh, go there, check it out. At our state fair booth, we have a huge uh, uh, a, a 
display of, uh, regarding pollinators, and we ask them to do a pollinator promise. And kids come in and say, I promise to plant not three plants, but 20 plants. Yes. Uh, and so we, we do that. We gave away wild flower packets. We still have many of them. We'll probably do it again this year and ask kids to take those home. It's been very successful. So we're doing our part uh, every, every day of the week. And it's easy to find on the MDA website. And I always tell people, go to MDA and go into that search bar and look at pollinators, and you'll get a lot of information. We are shameless at promoting one another. Yeah, are we? Yeah. But, but there are other, the University of Minnesota yeah. Extension has, we, the University of Minnesota has our bee lab, and we do a lot of research. And so you get honeybees as well as native pollinators, but there's the Pollinator Partnership was a nonprofit. You can go to the Xerxes Society. That's a lot of X's in there. I'm not going to spell it. <laughs> but that is your bee society, mm -hmm. and, it, and you sure. can get all sorts of information. Um, the, and what I found very exciting was our um, own Board of Water and Soil Resources, Bowser, mm -hmm. has a lot of different um, information packets out there for homeowners as sure. well. Sure, great. On that note, I know I should also say we could have, we'll have information on pioneer.org, our website as well. So Dave Fredrickson, Robin Trout, thank you for being with us. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it for this week on Compass. Join us next week as we take a look at how some local historical societies are collaborating to create a traveling exhibit. Thanks for watching.